Welcome. I want to walk through a couple examples in chapter one, chapter one dot one examples one dot one through one dot four. So, first, they talk about the example of uh, a situation that confronts lots of uh, retail stores is when to mark down seasonal material. For example, winter clothes or summer clothes at the end of the season. Bathing suits, you know, tend not to sell after a certain point like September when people go back to school and they don't want to have the inventory around forever so they heavily discount it after the summer. Now how do they make that decision as to how much to discount it, whether to discount it 10 percent, 20 percent, give a two for one sale, what's going to work best? Well there's three they use analytics to try to look at that. They can use descriptive analytics to sort of look at the historical pricing to see where they are today, what it looks like. They can use descriptive analytics to see the size of their inventory. If they're a little more advanced, they can use predictive analytics to use a forecast based on historical pricing. They may have known what happened last year when they discounted the prices. And the predictive can... They can use this historical information to see what the impact of changing prices will have on sales. So they can predict, use a predictive model to predict what's going to happen. Finally, they might use prescriptive analytics because you think of a very large retail store. They're not going to have one or two products they need to discount. They're going to have hundreds of products, hundreds of summer wear in hundreds of different scenarios. So they may want to use the prescriptive analytics to sort of optimize to say, computer, tell me the best pricing strategy for me to use to either minimize my inventory or maximize my earnings. So there are some real world examples of where different people use descriptive, predictive and prescriptive analytics. Now, let's move on to. Uh, Example 1.2, which is just learning some of the vocabulary of databases. So here we have a very simplistic database. And um, these top rows are what are called our fields or our attributes. And each one of these is an individual record. So if we want to talk about the fields, we're talking about customer ID, region, and payment. The specific fields are the actual data or the numbers included in them. Now the next thing we need to do, 1.3, is be able to <clears throat> classify these different fields or attributes. So here we have a supplier, an order number, an item number, an item description, a cost, quantity, arrival time. And we've got four different categories. We've got categorical, we've got ordinal, where we can order them, but we can't tell the difference between each one. We've got ratio where we can actually can compare one cost to another cost and say this costs 20 percent more. And we have interval data where it's where there's no zero starting time. We can't say the date 1018 is 20 percent more than another date because we have no starting point. We don't know when time starts. So this first one, aluminum is a categorical. It's, you can just put it into categories. The order number is ordinal. You can order the numbers, but you can't do any comparisons. And I don't know that the difference between one order to the next is always the same interval. So it's ordinal. The O-rings, again, are categorical. The cost, now cost, I can compare one cost to another and I can do a ratio. Same thing with quantities because I have a natural zero. I know zero quantity and zero cost. Finally, the rival time is, is interval data because there's a consistent space between each interval. I know one day to the next day is always the same interval. I don't know that with ordinal data. I don't know that item number 678, 679, and 680 all have the same distance between them. Time, I know that. So that's interval data. So... Make sure you're aware of these. I put these in green because I think the book says those are categorical. These are actually ordinal. Um, it's important to get 
be able to understand these different because when we get into statistics and other stuff, there's different types of analysis we can do and different ways we have to do it based on whether it's categorical or uh, ratio or some other type. Finally, they talk about different forms of a model. So lots of things we can do with a model. So let's say we're, we have a very simplistic example. Somebody says, well, how long does it normally take to mow the lawn? Well, if you think about it, oh, gee, verbally somebody says, you know, the, the grass, it normally doesn't take me too long, but it takes a long time if the grass is wet or the grass is, you know, is, 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 is really long. So to a certain extent, the amount of time it takes me to mow the lawn is a function of how long the grass is. If it's really, really long, it takes me a long time. If the grass is short and I had mowed it three days ago, then it's a piece of cake. So verbally, we could just explain it, and that would be one set of a model. We could sketch it, we could put some data points on, and we could draw a graph, and oh, okay, I can look at this graph and say, okay, is the lawn gets, uh, is, the, is the lawn gets longer, it takes longer time. And the last way I could do is I could come up with what's called a mathematical formula or function. I could actually say the time to mow the lawn in minutes is equal to eight times the length of the grass in inches plus 1.5. Now, the advantage of having this is now I can predict how long it's going to take me to mow the lawn for any length of grass, as opposed to the verbal is just conveys some pieces of information, but it doesn't really tell me exactly how long. Graphical, I can kind of see it, but only for the data points I graph. So most of the time we'll be working with mathematical equations or functions. Have a good day. Any questions, let me know.